I'm sure you'd like to join with me in thanking the Sunco singers uh, for that beautiful Reformation hymn. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, our worship leaders today who chose those hymns. Uh, the last one we sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness, um, is a personal favorite of mine. In fact, it's such a favorite, it's in my will to be read or sung at my funeral. So um, it's a beautiful song. But what I like about the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, is the context for that hymn, Thy mercies are new every morning. It's found in Lamentations chapter 3, when um, Jerusalem was being destroyed by the Babylonians, the people being taken into exile. Lamentations is the prophet lamenting that his nation is falling apart. And in the very midst of that uh, chapter of Lamentations, that whole book, he says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And uh, so that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, is a song uh, that comes from a pa passage of the Bible where the, the, uh, the writer is lamenting the fact that his nation seems to be falling apart before his eyes, and yet he affirms God's faithfulness in the midst of crisis. And so thank you so much for that a choice of him, for great is thy faithfulness. I'd like to give you all a warm welcome this morning, and um, for those of you watching online uh, in the States, in Canada, the uh, South Pacific, Europe, etc., we give you a warm welcome. Uh, we pray that the internet holds strong during our time here today. Uh, I've entitled our uh, sermon this morning, An Appeal to the Adventist Nobility. And uh, those of you who are familiar with your uh, heritage, uh, Reformation history, know that Luther also wrote a book called An Appeal to the German Nobility uh, that was circulated across Europe, um, but uh, so I've entitled this message An Appeal to the Adventist Nobility. So this is a sermon not just delivered uh, for us here as the Village Adventist Congregation, um, but uh, for that lady who wrote in, the physical therapist who lost her job because her employer found a statement on the Adventist website, this sermon is for you. And for all of our members worldwide who've lost their jobs because of the General Conference's position on vaccinations, this sermon is for you. And for our church leaders, I respectfully say this in love, this sermon is for you 
as well. Now, I've been around, I've got a few gray hairs, as you can see, and um, I've been around the world many, many times, and I know most of the church leaders personally and by name, and I would say this, they are some of the most hardworking people I've ever met in my life. If I want to reach the General Conference Legal Counsel, Brother Duke Metzian, I will send him an email at about 5.30 in the morning, because I know that's when he checks in, and he's going to respond. Between 5.30 and 6, I'll get a response from the General Conference Legal Counsel. He works extremely long hours. I've watched and observed Elder Wilson at close for many years, and I can say this, he is a man of God. Humility, it may be his, the way he, he lives his life. Um, he drinks from the wells of salvation on a daily basis. It's very clear when you sit in a committee and observe how he deals with matters that this is a man through whom the living waters flow. And so I, I, I give this sermon today to church leaders um, who are, I consider my personal friends, with whom I've worked for many years and with whom I, with whom I hope to serve for many more years uh, until Jesus comes again. But uh, as a minister of the gospel, it is also my responsibility to speak truth. And so today I want to share the truth in love, not because I'm superior or better, but because I'm inundated with people connecting with me and saying, I'm about to lose my job, what can I do? And I feel abandoned and I feel betrayed and I get told everywhere I look that this is not a religious liberty issue and so there's something wrong with me. And so I'm speaking today on behalf of the countless Adventists worldwide who are struggling with a sense of alienation because we are repeatedly told that the world church's position on vaccinations is X and that position precludes religious, religious waivers. And so um, it's not a difficult topic to talk about but I'm gonna give it my best shot. And um, I spent some time praying and thinking about this sermon. Uh, it's not a standard sermon as such, um, but I do believe that in an era of deceit, we must stand up and speak the truth and then the consequences will play themselves out. So I say this in love to my friends in the Adventist World Church leadership, those who've been instrumental in making these decisions and putting these statements together. Um, and I'm speaking not just on my behalf, but on behalf of multitudes of Adventists in America and Canada, who I know are watching right now, in South Africa, in Australia, in Germany, in Sweden, in New Zealand, etc., there are people around the world watching this sermon uh, because they know that, as Hamlet said, something is rotten in the heart of Denmark. So for our introduction, <clears throat> I just want to read you a letter that came in just recently as make sure, preaching these days is so complicated, you've got to have so many things, gadgets at your fingertips. Make sure I've got my, uh, my clicker here. So it's an appeal to the Adventist nobility. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, well, uh, the introduction, we're going to have uh, four parts. We're going to have an institutional perspective, then we're going to look at a theological perspective, a biblical perspective, then we're going to look at a financial perspective on these statements on immunization that are causing so much damage to Adventists and then we're going to draw our conclusions here together. So, um, <clears throat> by way of introduction, I have a, a letter here that came in, uh, it came in uh, to an Adventist in Canada. Maybe you're watching this very sermon here today. This is from an employer in Canada to a fellow sister in Christ. Quote, this is from the employer to the lady. It says, according to the statement reaffirming the Seventh-day Adventist Church's response to COVID-19 issued by the General Conference Administration and other bodies of the church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church encourages members to consider responsible immunization. In fact, this statement says, and then the letter quotes, it says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in consultation with the health ministries and public affairs and religious liberty departments of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, is convinced that the vaccination programs that are generally being carried out that is the COVID vaccinations, are important for the safety and health of our members and the larger community. Therefore, claims of religious liberty are not used appropriately in objecting to government mandates or employer programs designed to protect the health and safety of their communities." End quote. That's a general conference statement they're quoting from. And this is the conclusion that the employer gives to this lady in Canada. I have reviewed your request and supporting information as an Adventist, you have not articulated a sincerely held religious belief that would prevent you from complying 
with the university's mandatory vaccination program. On this basis, your request is denied and you are expected to comply with the mandatory vaccination program. Uh, so this person is expected to be vaccinated in order to keep uh, her employment with the university. Uh, we heard this morning, and I've heard many cases of students uh, in nations, not just America, Canada is a great example, students being denied access to college, uh, people being forced out of their jobs because employers are quoting from the Adventist Church's website and using what the Adventist Church has stated, uh, its position on vaccinations and mandates against its own members. So, <clears throat> We are experiencing now profound division worldwide as a globe. We're also experiencing division in the Adventist church. Why? Based on the official denominational position that vaccine mandates are not a religious, issue, religious liberty issue, but they're an employment issue in the minds of some, that Adventists have no theological or religious or faith-based reason not to participate in immunization programs, whether they are mandated or not. That's the official position. So how did we get here, and how do we respond? Well, let's just take a look at the offending documents. First of all, we're going to look first at the institutional perspective on the statements. So this is the first statement, and it's important to always you know, go back to the source documents. Uh, you can print it out for yourselves. It's adventist.org. Look in the official statements, type in immunization, and this is what will come up. Now, this was voted by the ADCOM, that is the Administrative Committee of the General Conference, on April 15, 2015. This was long before COVID was on anybody's mind. This statement was voted when the definition of vaccine was a substance introduced to the body to induce immunity against a given disease, and before the definition was changed to a substance introduced to the body to give immunity to the manufacturer, but to only stimulate your body's response to diseases in general which is a very watered-down definition, all right? So the ADCOM statement reads this, and it's important we know what the text says, and you can follow me on the screen. It says, the Seventh-day Adventist church places strong emphasis on health and well-being. The Adventist health emphasis is based on biblical revelation, the inspired writing of Ellen G. White, a co-founder of our church, and on peer-reviewed scientific literature. As such, we encourage responsible immunization slash vaccination and have no religious or faith-based reason not to encourage our adherents to responsibly participate in, prevent, in protective and preventive immunization programs. We value the health and safety of the population, which includes the maintenance of herd immunity. We are not the conscience of the individual church member and recognize individual choices. These are exercised by the individual. The choice to be, not to be immunized is not and should not be seen as the dogma nor the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So that's the foundation document, and just, just in passing, it was voted in 2015, just before the 2015 General Conference session. It was voted by the Administrative Committee, that we'll call that ADCOM as we go forward. Uh, for those of you who don't have spend much time in administration, uh, an ADCOM is an internal operating committee that deals with administrative trivia normally within an organization. It's not the executive committee and it's not the board. Um, but this was voted by the administrative committee of the general conference just prior to the 2015 general conference session. Now, based on that, um, uh, after Liberty and Health issued their statement and their, um, their appeal, which had over 20,000 people signing it, asking the World Church to take back their position on vaccination, the General Conference issued a subsequent statement which we're gonna call the reaffirmation statement. This is it here, and it's too long and wordy to put up on the screen, but it's, well, we're gonna call it the reaffirmation statement. It was voted, it was, it was released, sorry, in October 25th, 2021, so just a couple of months ago, and it was voted by the General uh, Conference Administration the General Conference Health Ministries Department, the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department, the General, Office, General Conference Office of Legal Counsel, and Loma Linda University Health. So first of all, we have the 2015 ADCOM statement, and then after Liberty and Health issued their um, appeal, uh, which had over 20,000 Adventists writing in and signing it, including well over 1,000 pastors, 
then this statement was issued, the reaffirmation statement that went into a lot more detail than this original statement. This was issued in October 2021. Uh, shortly um, before that, <clears throat> this is kind of a tangential issue, the NAD decided that they wanted to issue their own statement on vaccination, which essentially rewords, re reissues the 2015 statement. And this NAD statement was issued in March 2021. So in my opinion, as I look through these three statements, uh, here we have here, we have the 2015 ADCOM statement, the October 21 reaffirmation statement, and the NAD zone statement. The NAD zone statement essentially is a reiteration of the 2015 statement, and so we can basically put that to one side. And as we already know from the debates on women's ordination, um, union or divisions do not have their own constituency. They cannot make theological decisions for themselves. And so the division really has no right to be making any theological statements. Uh, so we're left with the 2015 ADCOM statement and the 2021 reaffirmation statement. Are you all with me so far on this? Yes, okay. So uh, <clears throat> we then, uh, we have the NAD statement from March 2021. Now, how do, we, how do we understand these statements? Well, um, this is a picture of a very famous British Member of Parliament, Tony Benn. I disagreed with him on pretty much everything he ever said. Um, he, he, he was a, a, foul of Ma a fan of Mao Zedong. Um, he was a, f a friend of the Soviet Union. Um, if, there, if, there, if there was ever a terrorist in town, he was their best friend. Um, he's dead now, um, but he was a man who stood up for what he believed. And even though I disagreed with everything he said, you could at least rely upon him to speak his mind honestly. He died, uh, I don't know, 20 some years ago of dementia. Um, so I, in my opinion, he had very early onset dementia about the age of 16, but never mind. Now, Tony Benn, uh, he had five questions. And these are five excellent questions that we need to be asking today. Those are the five questions. When he came across somebody in authority or somebody in power, he would ask these five questions. Firstly, what power do you have? Or what authority do you have? Two, where did you get this power from? Three, in whose interests do you exercise that power and authority? Number four, to whom are you accountable? And number five, how do we get rid of you? <clears throat> Those are good questions, yes? If you work your way through the first four questions, and you get the answers, you've made up your mind whether you want to exercise the fifth question or not. But those are five good questions to prevent totalitarianism developing in a society, to ask these questions and to expect an honest answer. Now today we're just gonna ask the first question, which is what power or what authority do you actually have? And we're gonna be asking ourselves the question, what authority do these bodies have to actually issue these statements? Because if they don't have the authority to issue the statements, these statements need to be revoked. Would you agree with me? All right. So let's turn first to the ADCOM of the General Conference. <clears throat> now, the ADCOM is the administrative committee of the General Conference. It's the internal administrative committee of the General Conference. The ADCOM does not have any inherent authority, but its authority is delegated to it by the lay members of the World Church when we vote on the General Conference Working Policy Manual updates at every General Conference session. That is, the ADCOM has no intrinsic, inherent authority. We delegate authority to the ADCOM to make decisions on our behalf because we can't all be involved in the administrative trivia of the running of the General Conference. So how does this work? Um, so um, just, to, just to the structure of the church, we are the Village Adventist Church congregation. We elect delegates. Um, in a business session, so we all have a vote, and those delegates go every constituency session to Michigan Conference for their constituency session. And every church sends its delegates, and those delegates, that's us regular lay folks, we elect the officers of the Michigan Conference for a four or five year period. You following me with this? Okay, and we also elect a lay, an executive committee of the Michigan Conference that has a majority lay representation. So the majority of people on the executive committee of the Michigan Conference are not church employees with vested interests. They're lay folks like you and I. 
and the Michigan Conference Executive Committee votes with majority lay representation on delegates to the, on, on who's going to be going to the Union Executive Committee, that's the Lake Union just up the road, and, the, and then the, Lake, the Union, they send delegates to the General Conference session, and that's voted by the Union Executive Committee, which has a majority of lay representation on it. So at every stage of the process, we have a majority of lay representation. And when the General Conference session meets, every union sends a certain number of delegates. You have the officers of the union, President, Secretary, Treasurer, are ex officio on the General Conference delegate, delegate list, but then you have a certain number of delegates, depending on your membership size, okay? And those delegates are mostly lay members like yourselves and myself. Now, um, in between General Conference sessions, how does the church make decisions? The church makes decisions through what is known as the Executive Committee. And the Executive Committee represents the constituency, that is the worldwide members, and the Executive Committee normally meets, unless there's an emergency, twice a year. It meets in April, that is known as spring meetings, and that's where they're reviewing the audit report for the previous year. And they also, but the big meeting is known as annual council, which meets in October of every year. It's normally in Silver Spring, Maryland, at the GC building. And the annual council votes on the priorities and the funding allocations for the following financial year that begins in January. And the, uh, the executive committee is comprised of the officers of the GC, the departmental heads of the GC, such as Health Ministries Department and Family Ministries Department and Youth Ministries Department. Uh, but the majority of the members of the executive committee are the representative, the union officers from around the world. Now, it's not a lay-driven committee, the executive committee, but we as lay people, through our voting for the Michigan Conference and through our representatives on the Michigan Conference, we have a profound say. In fact, we determine who our union officers are when we combine the, con the conferences of our Lake Union. So those union officers represent you and I at the General Conference Executive Committee. So you have the executive committee that meets twice a year, and then you have the General Conference session that meets once every five years, and then, because there's a lot of daily administrative decisions that need to be taken, uh, there is another committee yet known as the ADCOM. And the ADCOM deals with the day-to-day -day operations of the General Conference, like we need to put a new door security system in. We don't need the World Church to vote on that. Um, we, we need to change the per diem rate for people going to a certain country. We don't need the World Church to vote on that, and so forth and so forth. So the, the, the General Conference... Um, meets in full session every quinquennium, every five years, and then the, the executive committee meets in spring meeting and annual council every year, and that's where the major decisions get taken in the church. So, for instance, two years ago, just for COVID, the executive committee voted an updated statement on abortion. Do you remember that? Okay. That's a theological issue that affects every single member. That decision was not given to the ADCOM because the ADCOM deals with internal administrative matters. They did not vote the abortion statement at ADCOM, they voted it at the executive committee. Uh, that's, that represents the full constituency in between GC sessions. So as with the abortion statement that came out a couple of years ago, the executive committee is where decisions or statements or decisions are brought um, if we don't have time to wait for the next GC full session that affect every member worldwide, and that's generally theological matters and spiritual matters. This ADCOM, uh, for this ADCOM is reserved the internal administrative trivia of the Adventist headquarters. So, uh, just in summary, the ADCOM has authority to act um, as defined by the General Conference Working Policy. This is the General Conference Working Policy. It's a beautiful book, and um, <clears throat> I've got a few dog ears in here. Um, this is the kind of book that you read if you have to, um, <clears throat> but um, it's actually an essential book because Jesus says, in all things do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, Matthew 7, 12. This explains internally within the church structures how this takes place, okay? And this is what the GC has, and each of the 13 divisions has one of these, and every one of the 200 plus divisions has one of these, and every one of the conferences, missions, missions sections, fields, conferences, institutions has one of these. So there must be almost a thousand of these different documents scattered around the world. Um, and, but uh, even so, this is the one, if you want to read something interesting, this is the one that's going to um, at least help you with insomnia. So that's the General Conference working policy. Now, the point about this is, is that the ADCOM 
only acts in areas where it has delegated authority, and it does not have the right to make theological statements that affect every Adventist worldwide. That's the fundamental point here. Just to give you an idea, what does this document here say that the ADCOM can do? Now, you know, uh, take a deep breath. We're going to dive into some really interesting administrative trivia here. This is what the ADCOM has delegated authority to cover. To review any allegations against a GC officer, and if necessary, place such officer on administrative leave until the matter has been investigated by the full executive committee. To call the full executive committee when needed to appoint a new president. To determine immigration sponsorships for new GC workers to the US. To authorize under associate treasurers as check signers. To recommend amendments to the church manual. To the executive committee to authorize exceptional financial audits by GCAS to authorize institutions to establish their own investment policies, to modify liquidity requirements for sub-entities, to approve modifications to home-based deposits for international service employees, to establish token-based country deposits for ISEs serving at the GC or GC institutions. Are you still with me, yes? To approve the sharing of costs for external auditors to serve as the publisher for Sabbath School Guides, although the editors of the Sabbath School Study Guides are appointed by the Executive Committee. To approve an outgoing officer of the GC to perform limited responsibilities on, on an ad hoc basis during the transition to new officers after a GC session. To arbitrate in disputes between denominational publishing houses. To appoint the, to appoint the Spirit of Prophecy Committee and the Sabbath School Publications Board. To appoint survey commissions at division expense to evaluate the need and viability of proposed unions. To recommend 20 session delegates from among the GC employees to the full executive committee, to recommend changes to the International Board of Education and Working Policies to the executive committee, to review proposed variations from official host division remuneration plans, and to approve legal action for trademark protection purposes. Wouldn't you love to serve on that committee? Actually, be very grateful there are people who do serve on that committee. Because as the church grows, we may say in America, this all sounds bureaucratic and, and and formalized and so forth, but we live in a society where we have systems that take care of our basic needs. If you're living in a part of the world where there is basically chaos or anarchy, the church represents a haven of stability and transparency and, 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 um, and that tries its best to eliminate the racial and the tribal and the ethnic hatreds that exist in many parts of the world. So even though this may appear, oh, why do we have to have all of this stuff? We say that from a Western context, but if you're coming from a context of civil war or ethnic cleansing, the General Conference working policy in the field and the mission of the division policies represents a haven of stability and dignity and transparency in decision making. So it's not to be just, it actually serves a very useful purpose. But the key point is, <clears throat> when you look through the General Conference working policy, <clears throat> the ADCOM has delegated authority and power from the worldwide membership via our representative governments model to act in administrative matters pertaining to the uh, internal operations of the GC and of GC employees. We can agree on that. But the key point is this, the ADCOM does not have the authority anywhere given to it to determine theological or spiritual matters for all members worldwide from 2015 until Jesus comes again. It simply does not have that authority. It's a fundamental point. Now, we all assume that they did, that they do have the authority because they made the statement, but I'm here to say to you today, after many years of working administration, the ADCOM does not have that delegated authority. Therefore, the statement is invalid. If the statement, if those issuing the statement did not have the authority to issue the statement, which is the foundation of the entire church's position on vaccinations, this statement needs to be revoked. Theological matters, up to and including the voting of new fundamental beliefs, because they affect every Seventh-day Adventist worldwide, are the remits of the General Conference in full session, with a majority of lay representatives casting their votes. In fact, the General Conference working policy actually says, and I'm quoting from section B0506 there, the definition of denominational beliefs is entrusted to the General Conference in session. So theological matters are entrusted to the world church when we have a majority of lay people making the decision. The ADCOM, there's not a single lay person on that ADCOM. Every person who voted for that statement, I believe was a church employee paid for from tithe or other sources of income. And therefore they're not, they, are, they're in a, they have a conflict of interest when they vote those statements. We'll come to why they have a conflict of interest shortly. Now the second statement that we have is this reaffirmation statement. Now this statement says, <clears throat> let's take, take a look here. 
Oh, let's come back to the adcom. The adcom says, uh, we encourage responsible immunization of vaccination and have no religious or faith-based reason. This is a theological statement. As I've said repeatedly, the ADCOM does not have the, the right to make such statement. This is known as an ultra vires act. Ultra vires, ultra means beyond. Vires um, is from the Latin. The Latin word for man is a vir, V-I-R. You get the word v uh, virile from that, or virility. A uh, man is virile if he's manly. And so um, an ultra vires act means that when the ADCOM voted this statement in 2015, they were acting beyond their delegated powers to make such a statement. So then we come to the reaffirmation statement itself. And the reaffirmation statement is even more intriguing. <clears throat> and the reaffirmation statement actually hardened up our position. And it's the reaffirmation statement that's being used more than the original vaccination statement to deny Adventists their religious exemption requests. Why is that? Because the reaffirmation statement says, therefore, claims of religious liberty are not used appropriately in objecting to government mandates or employer programs designed to protect the health and safety of their communities. Now, <clears throat> again, you know, I've, I've gone through this and you can highlight various things in here, but the, the interesting thing is who issued this statement? It's issued by a combination of General Conference Administration, so it's not the ADCOM, it's just the administrators, the Biblical Research Institute, the General Conference Health Ministries Department, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department, General Office of Legal Counsel, and Loma Linda University Health. Now, um, at risk of repeating myself, I just want to say this clear. Nowhere ever in Adventist history have the members via the session, General Conference in full session, or the ADCOM, or the Executive Committee ever authorized this group of people to make such a statement. You know, it's like us cobbling together. I'm going to gather like three people here. We're going to issue a statement on behalf of the World Church. This is a theological statement that denies religious, effectively denies religious exemption waivers to Adventists worldwide, and it's put together by a group of people who were never tasked or delegated the authority to make such a statement. Nowhere. This came out in response to the Liberty, Liberty and Health Appeal. I understand that. But with all due respect to those who are watching online, and I say this in love, we the members have never delegated to this group of people ever the authority to make a theological statement like that. You don't have that authority. This last week at the OSHA Supreme Court, the Supreme Court held that OSHA did not have the authority given to it to make the mandates. And I'm here today to say the same thing, that we the members have never in Adventist history given this group of people this, uh, this, this, um, this constellation of departments, the right to make theological statements that deny religious liberty requests to members worldwide. So, <clears throat> regardless of how fine the wording is, this reaffirmation statement is inherently illegitimate, void, and like the ADCOM statement, needs to be revoked immediately. Furthermore, our system of representative governments requires majority lay representation at the field level, the conference level, the union level, the division level, and GC session decision-making forums. And as far as I can figure out, everybody who voted for this and everybody who voted for this were paid-up church employees. And as we're going to see shortly, they were operating under a profound financial conflict of interest. There was no lay representation in making of decisions where church employees will not lose their jobs, but Adventists worldwide will lose their jobs. There's something wrong with this. There is something profoundly wrong with a system that publishes on the Adventist Review Statement a call for the ex appropriate exclusion from employment and social engagement, while simultaneously demanding that those members return their tithes to the institution that says well, you can be excluded from employment. Something is rotten in the heart of Denmark. So even if the ADCOM statement and the reaffirmation statement were revoked today, employers worldwide have been using these statements to deny religious exemption requests by Adventists who are losing their jobs, who are losing their ability to study their chosen courses at university. Every day that these statements remain out on the website, regular church members who are entirely innocent are paying a terrible price. 
as the ADCOM statement exceeded ADCOM's delegated authority and the reaffirmation statement was issued by an ad hoc group that has never been delegated any authority to make such a statement, I believe the GC is honor bound to withdraw both statements immediately, to apologize to and to make restitution to every Adventist who has lost their job as a result of employers using these illegitimate statements to delay their religious exemption requests. <clears throat> Which brings us to the theological perspective, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to delve into the scriptures here. The ADCOM statement includes this statement. We've already briefly covered it. As such, we encourage responsible immunization of vaccination and have no religious or faith-based reason not to encourage our adherents to responsibly participate in protective and preventative immunization programs. Now, what this statement effectively does spiritually is it denies you and I the ability to affirm the convictions of the Holy Spirit vis-a-vis -vis vaccines in our lives. It denies the right of the Holy Spirit to speak to you on the matter. And as such, it represents um, a de facto denial of the, of the Holy Spirit having any right to speak to you on the matter of vaccinations. This is the, the theological impact of this particular statement. Now, the proclamation of the everlasting gospel in Revelation 14 assumes that despite diametric disagreement with the dominant narrative of our fallen world, despite social isolation, the, the, the demands and the dogmas of mainstream media, economic exclusion, employment mal mandates, and ultimately the death penalty, Earth's inhabitants remain the freedom of conscience sufficient to respond to the call to fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. We rely on freedom of conscience to the very end in the proclamation of the three angels' messages. We should not be denying conscience before that final crisis arrives. But what is your conscience? Because you may have a seared conscience. Now, our conscience, I'd say a summary, is a God-given inner faculty by which the Holy Spirit gives an awareness of the morality of given actions, thoughts, and decisions. Romans chapter 2 and verse 15 describes it thus. It says, Paul says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In this passage here, the apostle Paul is discussing how does God judge the Gentiles who've yet to hear the gospel, who do not have the law of Moses, etc., and he says, okay, in the final judgment, God will judge the Gentiles who've never heard the gospel because God knows what the, what he spoke, how he spoke to them through their conscience, and he knows the conflicting, the accusing, or the excusing thoughts of their minds, how they responded to the promptings of the Holy Spirit through their conscience. That's how God will judge those who have never heard the gospel. He judges them according to the light that they had through their conscience. Through our conscience, the Holy Spirit bears witness to what we already know to be God's will. Romans 9 and verse 1 says this, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That is, through our conscience, the Holy Spirit reveals God's will to us as an individual and as a community of faith. But it's also possible to have a seared conscience. The 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2 says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And so our conscience may be seared, we may lose the ability to hear the Holy Spirit through our conscience, uh, through a, repe a repeated refusal to listen to the Holy Spirit, and through willful indulgence of sin. That's in Romans 1.24. And thus our conscience has become an unreliable moral guide. So if you are saying today that I don't want to take the vaccine for conscien conscientious reasons, in order to have credibility, you need to be listening to the Spirit in other areas of your life and not living in willful sin. Somebody asked me about this the other day. Uh, it's hard to say I, don't, I can't in good conscience take the vaccine because I believe it may harm me if you're drinking Coca-Cola and eating Twinkies all day long. Okay? If, if you are living with your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, you need to take that seriously and allow into your body only that which you honestly and conscientiously believe is good for your physical and spiritual and mental health. You cannot say, I can't take the vaccine in, in good conscience if, for instance, you're filling your mind with pornography or violence, okay? The diet that goes into your mind affects you as well. And so, if we are to claim a religious exemption to something like the vaccine, 
We need to be living transparently, authentically Christian lives where we are sensitive to and obedient to the promptings of the Spirit in all areas of our lives, okay? This calls for a whole body response as a Christian, not just I'll live my own life, but I'm not going to take the vaccines, I'm going to claim a religious exemption. We have to be consistent and honest in how we uh, respond to the Holy Spirit. In Romans 14, 23 says this, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That is to go against God's will, as revealed by the convicting and converting power of the Spirit in your conscience, is a sin. So a conscience is to be informed and nurtured by your study of the Word of God, and uh, which, like the Holy Spirit, leads us to the incarnate Word of God, that is Jesus Himself. Now, our fundamental beliefs, if we just take a look at those for a minute, they are voted by the General Conference in full session with majority lay representation, and in the hierarchy of documents in our church, um, the fundamental beliefs override both of these statements. All right? The fundamental beliefs override these statements. Fundamental belief 22 says this, for the Spirit to recreate in us the character of our Lord, we involve ourselves only in those things which will produce Christ-like purity, health, and joy in our lives. It also means that because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, we are to care for them intelligently. Along with adequate exercise and rest, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from the unclean foods identified in the Scriptures. Since alcoholic beverages, tobacco, and the irresponsible use of drugs and narcotics are harmful to our bodies, we are to abstain from them as well. Now, this fundamental belief affirms that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as per 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It affirms that we are to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in producing Christ-like purity and health. Yeah, wrong slide there. We are to co cooperate with the Holy Spirit in producing Christ-like purity and health. This is not just emotional or spiritual health. This is physical health. The context is very clear. We're talking about physical health here, and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in, as the Holy Spirit leads us to a state of physical health. When I am physically healthy, my mind is better able to perceive heavenly truth. That is a relationship between mind, body, and soul. If you are suffering from, let's say you have a medical problem and it leads to depression, you are less likely to perceive heavenly truth than if you are cured of that medical problem, your depression lifts and your mind is restored to its full functional capabilities. Okay, so this statement is not just talking about mental or spiritual health, it's talking about physical health. That's very, very clear from the context of the whole statement. Now, um, in the book published by the General Conference, the, the 28 Fundamental Beliefs, there's a comment by Darmstadt on this, and it says, true Christians beholding Christ will continually glorify God with their bodies, realizing they are His prized possessions bought with His precious blood. So therefore, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatsoever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. We bring glory to God through the choices of what we allow into our bodies and also into our minds and also what we allow to pass our tongues one way or the other. So the Spirit speaks to us through our conscience and we thus cooperate with and are led by the Spirit in producing a Christ-like purity and physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Therefore, as per the Word of God, these passages we've quoted, and Fundamental Belief 22, what you allow into your body is a matter of conscience, that is, the Holy Spirit does guide us in these matters, and therefore, automatically, because it's a matter of conscience, must be considered a religious liberty matter by our PAL leaders, public affairs and religious liberty. Now, the reaffirmation statement here says this, <clears throat> I mean, some of it we agree with. So, since our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we are Christ's by creation and redemption, we should personally seek God's will about COVID-19 vaccinations, which implies that you're asking the Holy Spirit to lead you, does it not? Yes. Absolutely. Why would you personally seek God's will if the decision's already been made by the General Conference ADCOM? It is a matter of personal choice. We firmly believe that in matters of personal conviction, conviction by the who? The Holy Spirit. We must be guided by the Word of God, our conscience, that's where the Holy Spirit moves upon our minds, and through informed judgment. So this statement would say, well, we actually agree with this, yet later on, the statement goes on to conclude that claims of religious liberty are not used appropriately in objecting to mandates or employer, empl employer programs. How do they come to that conclusion that, that this is a matter of conscience, that you pray to your Heavenly Father, you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, but then you cannot use 
um, li religious liberty to refuse a certain vaccination. Uh, there's a complete disconnect within this statement, okay? It doesn't add up. The con the, we agree with the preamble, but we disagree with the conclusion. It's inexplicable. If taking a vaccine is a matter of conscience, as this statement affirms, notwithstanding the fact that it's an illegitimate statement, even if we accept what the statement says, it does say that taking the vaccination is a matter of conscience. As a matter of conscience, it is automatically a religious liberty issue. Now, we have heard from our religious liberty establishment for two years repeatedly, like a mantra, this is not a religious liberty issue. But even the General Conference's own reaffirmation statement affirms this is uh, where you ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you through your conscience. Therefore, it must be a religious liberty issue. And we have effectively been abandoned by our religious liberty hierarchy in our country who simply don't want to deal with the social pushback of standing up for Adventists who have religious objections. The <clears throat> General Conference working policy here, I'm not going to read that, I printed out the, the PAL section, some quotes. <clears throat> and the general, this is voted by the members. These are pretty profound statements. It says, the use of force and coercion is, is inimical to life, to dignity, and to authentic religion. Amen. Now listen to what religious liberty deals with. Religious liberty deals with a person's relationship with God, the Creator. So if God speaks to you through your conscience, it is, by definition, a religious liberty matter. Adventists, therefore, view religious liberty as the primordial human right that undergirds all human rights. Why do we understand that? Because when God created Adam before Eve came along, the, only the first commandment applied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And um, it's only with the creation of Eve, with, with human companionship, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. So the first commandment is the greatest, and that relationship with God between Adam and God in the Garden of Eden existed before all other human relationships. That's why your fundamental human right, number one, is your relationship with your Heavenly Father. The document goes on to say, Paul, that is Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, was one of the original core departments of the church, was initially established to promote and maintain religious liberty, with particular emphasis upon the most intimate freedom, individual liberty of what? Conscience. The department works, allegedly, for the religious liberty, that is, the conscience-driven convic conscience convictions of individual church members. No, it doesn't. For the last two years, we've been repeatedly told that the religious, by the religious liberty leaders that the vaccine mandates are not a matter of religious liberty. But even the church's own documents, the reaffirmation statement, we affirm that vaccination is a matter of conscience. And in the general conference working policy, which you see on the board there, the de religious liberty departments, their job is to protect your conscience. Therefore, it is a religious liberty matter. You can't say it's not a religious liberty matter like a mantra and expect everyone all to all just accept that. We're thinking people out here. We can read the documents, and if you're not willing to stand up for the religious convictions of your members, step aside and let people stand up who will. But don't abandon your members. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Jesus taught in Luke 9, Luke 11, 9 through 13, that we may ask our Heavenly Father for the gift of the Holy Spirit but he did not teach us that we can schedule the convicting power of the Spirit for a more convenient time in salvation history. Jesus taught Nicodemus in John 3, verse 8, just as the wind blows where and where it chooses, so the Spirit moves with divine sovereignty upon the hearts, minds, and consciences of fallen humanity. I'm grateful for the moving of the Holy Spirit. Because time and again, the Holy Spirit says, Conrad, you've messed up there, and you need to apologize, and you need to repent. If the Holy Spirit were not speaking to me, I wouldn't know when I need to repent. And I want to be in heaven, so do you. I want to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. So I'm grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be a convictor of sin and a pointer out of my need for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, the fact that secular employers and our GC leadership appear to view mandates as an employment issue is utterly irrelevant. We are accountable to God not for how we respond to these statements that are made by committees that were never authorized to make such statements. 
we are accountable before God for how we respond to the moving of the Spirit upon our hearts and minds. And therefore, this is absolutely a religious liberty issue. Adventists have been warned of times like this would arrive. The book Acts of the Apostles says this, God desires his people to prepare for the soon coming crisis. Prepared or unprepared, they must all meet it. And those only who have brought their lives into conformity to the divine standard will stand firm at the time of test and trial. When secular rulers unite with ministers of religion to dictate in matters of conscience, then it will be seen who really fear and serve God. Let that sink in. I don't think when Sister Wright wrote this chapter, she was thinking of this event here, but the, 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 um, the, the boot does fit the feet. When secular rulers, OSHA, unite with ministers of religion, people who make these kind of statements, to dictate in matters of conscience, then it will be seen who really fear and serve God. When the darkness is deepest, the light of a godlike character will shine the brightest. When every other trust fails, then it will be seen who have an abiding trust in Jehovah. And while the enemies of truth are on every side, watching the Lord's servants for evil, God will watch over every one of them for good. He will be to them as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. You know, it is time for us to stand up for truth and not to be ashamed of truth. And uh, as Pastor Kelly said last night, we are not anti or pro-vax at this event. We are pro you acting according to your conscience. And we affirm in this church your rights to act according to your conscience without condemnation. If you take the vaccination in good conscience, I'm happy for you. If you choose not to take it in good conscience, we'll likewise support that decision because it's a decision between you and God. And so we are not to unite with secular rulers to dictate in matters of conscience. Fallen humanity can choose how we respond to the conviction of the Spirit, but we cannot choose how, when, or where we come under that conviction of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot be controlled, scheduled, or denied access by public affairs and religious liberty leaders, cannot be controlled by the Reaffirmation Committee, and the presence and the conviction of the Holy Spirit can certainly not be scheduled by the outcome of the General Conference, okay? To think in this way is essentially an act of blasphemy, for we will be, de we will be determining when and how God has permission to appear in our lives. We would then be playing God. So therefore, we do not accept any church leader, starting with myself, who says, you cannot be convicted by the Holy Spirit in a certain way. So then we come to the financial components, and this is our last component, and it's 104, and I'm, I'm just like, where did our time go this morning? <clears throat> the financial perspective, you know, there's a, you follow the money, you come to the answer. Kui bono, who benefits from all this? Well, um, I did some digging with some administrators from Adventist Healthcare. They'll remain nameless, but they're men of conscience. We looked at the 1099 forms, so, so the publicly available tax forms from the IRS, and these are the data for the latest year from 2019. And the bottom line is this. In 2019, we received um, 6.2 billion from Medicare and 3.2 billion from Medicaid. And because we had that foundation funding in our hospital systems, we received another 11.2 billion from private payments, payment, uh, patient payments, and so forth, meaning that in 2019, we received just over almost $21 billion into our Adventist healthcare system. $21 billion. Let me just remind you, our total tithe in the NAD is about $1 billion. And yet we receive about $20 billion in funding that's entirely dependent upon Medicaid Medicare funding, and Medicaid Medicare with the federal government are really pushing hard the mandates right now, as we know. Their right to impose mandates was upheld at Supreme Court. Now, significant portions of this healthcare income are then donated via grants to our Adventist in, uh, institutions. So, Columbia Union Conference in 2019 received about 225,000 from local hospitals. The GC received 55,000, Pine Forge Academy 50,000, Spenceville Academy 36,000, Spenceville Adventist Church 201,000, Washington Adventist University 34,000, Loma Linda Church 187,000. These figures are all publicly available in the tax documents that you can find if you look for them online. Now beyond this, our current structure in the United States, and this is important for Adventists around the world who are watching this, our current structure in the US involves legally incorporated nonprofits like Michigan Conference receiving tax deductible donations due to our 501c3 status with the IRS. 
we received federal Medicaid and Medicare funding to the tune of almost 10 billion, and that was 2019. Medicaid and Medicare funding skyrocketed in 2020 with the pandemic, with all the, the government payments because of COVID. So it's probably significantly higher than that, uh, 21 billion now. Uh, federally regulated and guaranteed bank and retirement accounts, federal student loans for our colleges, not even looking at our colleges here today, secular accreditation for our colleges, a full-time professional clergy benefiting from IRS parsonage allowance while serving as agents of the state when signing wedding certificates. It's rather amazing to me how, given our eschatology and the role of America in crushing conscience at the end of time, how much we're in bed financially with the second beast of Revelation. Now, the General Conference Working Policy says this, good advice. It says, Jesus never used confrontational message, methods such as economic or physical pressure. Church members should and institutions must remain free and independent from organizations which might violate a member's conscience. The union of church and state, or you know, healthcare and OSHA, or HHS, is a sure formula for discrimination and intolerance and offers a fertile soil for the spread of persecution. And we say, amen. This is what our public affairs and religious liberty department section says in our working policy manual, and we see this happening in front of our very eyes, do we not? Absolutely. We see this happening in front of our very eyes. And so this is where we must ask the much broader question. This goes way beyond COVID vaccination mandates, and it is this. As America drifts before our eyes from the land of the free, the home of the brave, into the prophesied totalitarian second beast of Revelation 13, for how long can we honestly feast on federal funds? Because when you feast on federal funds, you dance to the federal tune. The HH, the Health and Human Services mandate, was upheld by the SCOTUS this week. That means that all of our healthcare system that receives Medicaid and Medicare now has to have this mandate for the certain vaccine. Now, thankfully, they're giving out religious exemption waivers, but in some of our hospitals, that's because so many staff just said, we're leaving if you don't give us the waivers. It wasn't because we were actively promoting freedom of conscience in our institutions. So as America drifts and becomes this totalitarian beast of revelation, how long can we remain an honest prophetic voice to our society while we are financially dependent on the, on the funding from that second beast? I'm asking a hard question, am I not? Yes. Sooner or later, we have to ask that question because our dependence on federal funding to keep our tithe going in the NAD is driving documents like this that is hurting Adventists around the rest of the world. Adventists in Canada, Adventists in Australia, Adventists in, in the, in, across Europe, etc., are losing their jobs because of these statements that are coming from administrators who, who, for whom the primary driver of tri tithe in their conference is Medicaid, Medicare funding. So we are allowing the second beast of revelation to drive our policy making in a way that tramples on the conscience of our members worldwide. Something is not right in the heart of Denmark. Something is not right. So many Adventist jobs and so much tithe in our division is dependent on the ongoing flow of federal funding. If we refuse federal funding, almost every Adventist college, clinic, or hospital in the, air, in the U.S. would either close or be sold off immediately. And our tithe base would shrink dramatically when you take Florida and Southeast California Conference out of our tithe base, which is mostly driven by healthcare tithes. The NAD tithe shrinks dramatically. To argue that federal funding... 11 billion, 10 billion dollars a year, generating another 11 billion of private payments. To argue that federal funding in the US is not influencing our refusal to recognize the spirit-led convictions and religious exemption requests of Adventists to the vaccination mandates is profoundly naive. He who pays the piper calls the tune. To put it simply, our dependence on federal funding in the US for jobs and tithe means we cannot afford to recognize the claims of conscience for our members in these matters. When the financial needs of the institutional church for funding from the second beast of Revelation 13 cause the institutional church to effectively deny the consciences of individual members, we are crossing a red line. Let me repeat that. When the financial needs of the institutional church for funding from the second beast of Revelation cause the institutional church to deny the consciences of individual members, we are crossing a red line. We are in uncharted territory. We are crossing 
a red line, and now the General Conference Working Policy actually talks about this. It says the church has historically taught that its members and institutions dare not violate their individual or corporate consciences. Well, you wouldn't know that, would you? By supporting organizations, policies, or activities incompatible with the principles set forth in Scripture. Now, so that's what the working policy says. The tragedy is that when we issue statements like this, we're effectively denying the conscience that is upheld within our working policy manual. This was voted by the members. This was not voted by the members. We need to uphold what we voted as members, not some illegitimate statements made by people who are living essentially off the federal funding tithe. So when we align ourselves institutionally with the employment mandates, which are very similar to embryonic buy or sell mandates, the second beast over the consciences of our members, we are perilously close to losing our raison d'etre as God's end time movement. So what are we saying in conclusion? Our time is up, and um, we've spoken quite bluntly about a few things here this morning. I want to reiterate again that I say these things in love, but... For every member who's lost your job out there, this sermon has been for you. And for every member who has been feel pressured to take a vaccine and has maybe suffered side effects and nobody really cares, this sermon has been for you. And for every member who's now struggling about whether to take a vaccine or not and uh, your employer has denied you access to a religious waiver because of these statements that have been issued by the World Church, this sermon is for you. You're not on your own. There's a worldwide movement of Adventists with you and praying with you and for you. So I would conclude by saying this, uh, an appeal to our Adventist nobility. Number one, I'd respectfully and lovingly urge you to rescind the 2015 ADCOM statement and the 2020 reaffirmation statement immediately, or 2021 reaffirmation statement immediately, as they are institutionally ultra vires, they are beyond your authority to act, and they are theologically blasphemous. Secondly, I want to encourage you to establish a fund to compensate Adventists who have suffered loss due to the distribution of these illegitimate statements. Thirdly, I want to affirm the biblical right of everybody watching today to be vaccinated or not according to their conscience. This is a religious liberty issue by definition. Fourthly, a, ch a challenge to our church leaders and institutions, do not negatively treat employees who choose against the dominant narrative of the second beast of Revelation 13. And finally, this is an appeal to all of us. The gospel goes to the end of the world and it appeals to people to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Jesus has promised that he's coming again and he wants people who are ready for him. And that can only take place if we are champions of conscience today. We cannot say to people, um, follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit and join God's end time remnant movement. But when you join, you have to switch off the conscience about what goes into your body because we've already determined the, con the Spirit can't speak to you in those matters. If we celebrate conscience and we appeal to people to follow Jesus, they must follow the Lamb wherever He leads, not only where we determine He can lead. Let us reclaim our responsibility as leaders and as members to be champions of freedom of conscience for if we refuse to stand for freedom of conscience today, how can we honestly and legitimately and with credibility appeal to conscience in the proclamation of the three angels' messages, which is what God is calling us to do as an end time movement? So stand for freedom of conscience. Honor people's freedom of conscience. Do not denigrate them for the conscientious decisions that they make. And for our church leaders, we love you, we respect you. And we speak in love today and say, please hear this a plea, not just from myself, but from thousands of members worldwide, uh, with this appeal to the Adventist nobility, once again, stand for conscience and unite our worldwide church. May God bless you as you make a decision. I invite you to bow your heads with me, and we will close with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of our worship service here today, we thank you for that fundamental human right to respond to the voice of your conscience speaking to each of our hearts. Father, may, not, may we not have a seared conscience, but may we act in honesty to the promptings of your spirit today and tomorrow and through this coming week. Father, as your spirit prompts us, may we live in love with our neighbor and in a humble obedience before you. 
I pray, Father, that people will see in us a manifestation of the glory and the character of you, radiating through our lives and heard in every word that we say and all the, the actions we take. Father, we pray for our church leaders, for whom this has maybe not been the most pleasant sermon to listen to, but Father, I thank you for them, for their years of faithful service, for their shepherding of the flock, for their willingness to go long distances and deal with intractable problems. I pray, Father, as this COVID pandemic appears to lose steam and fade away, I pray that our church leaders will have the courage to do what is right and to do what is necessary to unify our church again. Oh, Father, may your spirit work upon all of our hearts and all that we say and do in the coming week may it be characterized by the selfless and the self-sacrificing love of Jesus. Father, as we dismiss from this meeting now, from this place of worship, for those of us who are here, we thank you for the food that has been prepared in the fellowship hall. We thank you for those who have prepared it, and we ask that with the strength that it gives us, we will continue to bring honor and glory to you. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.